Hebrews chapter 13. If you would join me there, please. Hebrews 13. I'm going to begin reading with verse number 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7. Before I get started, I'm going to ask God for a blessing. Oh, how He knows what kind of blessing I need. Amen. We need. Amen. I just got a little idea, but He knows it real good. Help me if you will. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, with every serious ounce within us, we need your blessing today. God, we're totally, completely destitute of anything that's good, anything that's lasting. There may be something in uh, the flesh of human beings that can entertain or amuse or titillate, but God, that's not why we're here. That's right. And that amusement or uh, excitement or whatever, that's not going to do us any good when we're out there in the trenches this coming week trying to walk with you. When we're all by ourselves, no one else around, and know that what we do, you see, and is right. being recorded in heaven. And we want to do right. Thank you. Not just what other folks see. So God, please pour blessing out today. We know you value your word very highly. As far as I know, the most valuable thing on this earth present today is the word of God. And we need that word. So we're asking you, God, if you will, uh, just pour a blessing on us today as we attempt to go into it together. We, we thank you for this and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Verse 7, chapter 13, book of Hebrew. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Now, the uh, series, quote unquote, that we're working through here in chapter 13 is serving God acceptably, and I've entitled today's portion, today's message, Establish Your Heart. Establish Your Heart. Back in 1226, the Apostle mentioned to us the coming event, uh, spoken of several times in scriptures, and every time that you come across it, it's always referenced by the word shaking. Shaking. Uh, really, I happened to come across another one this past week, Ezekiel 38, verse 19 and following, talking about the shaking. And this shaking that's coming is going to be, as it were, an announcement, like a doorbell being pushed and letting you know something is right there, getting ready to happen. It'll be the end of time as we know it. It'll be the end of this age of mortal life on earth. It'll be the end of the conflict between rebellious mankind and the Creator. So in uh, light of that day or that event, we as believers and as disciples of Christ have decided to do what God said to do in chapter 12, 28. That's serve God acceptably. Amen. That's what we want to do. And we'll do that with reverence and godly fear. And we're enabled to do that by holding on to grace holding fast to this grace, if you will, by having in our possession the grace of God. Now, just a quick reminder here. The grace of God is not some ambiguous church jargon. It's not a vague religious phrase. The grace of God is something we can actually sink our teeth into. The grace of God, Titus 2, verse 11 and 12, the grace of God is that predisposition on God's part to offer salvation to all folks, teaching us how to live, excuse me, how to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, teaching us how to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world while we wait. Well, what are we waiting on? Some of y'all are waiting for me to get done. I ain't even got started good yet. While we wait for that blessed hope and glorious appearing. Amen. The grace of God, y'all, is real and it's what causes us to do 
what we do. Now, if we'll hold fast to this grace, then we'll be able to serve God acceptably. Now, we've seen thus far, or at least looked at, four aspects of actually and practically serving God acceptably. Today's characteristic or aspect is to establish your heart. Establish your heart. But first, I'd like to call your attention, please, again to verse 7, verse 17, and verse 24. Verse 7, remember them which have the rule over you. Verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you. Verse 24, salute all of them that have the rule over you. We're given three specific things we're to do to one specific grouping in the church. Remember, obey, and salute them that have the rule over you. Well, who is this one specific group within the church? Verse 7, those who have spoken unto you the word of God. Verse 17, those who watch for your souls. Verse 17, those who will give account for your souls. Yes. Obviously what we're looking at here is that one specific group are God's pastors. Amen. And most specifically, God-called pastors, the shepherds, if you will, to borrow the Bible picture, the shepherds of God's flock. Amen. Now, I'd like to examine these three verses together and the plan is, if it's the Lord's will, to do this at the end of our study of chapter 13, uh, since they all deal with the same subject. But for this morning, I'd like to borrow the last phrase out of verse number 7 there. We've already read it. But the bottom line is this. If a church has a God-called pastor, there are two things we've been instructed to do. Number one, we're to follow his faith. Number two, we're to consider the end of his conversation. As always, the definitions are what rings my bell. The word follow there is the Greek word mimos, and it's where we get our English word mimic. Mimic. And it means to imitate. The word consider comes from a Greek word that means to be a spectator. To be a spectator. So this is telling us that if a church has, in fact, a God-called pastor, we're to look attentively at, we're to be a spectator of his lifestyle, a spectator of his behavior, and because of that, mimic or imitate his faith. Imitate the results in his life of his having been persuaded of the truth of God's Word. That's what we're being told to do there. Now, with everything else that's being included there, it addresses this one thing for our purposes this morning. All pastors are not necessarily God-called. Right. All pastors are not necessarily God-called pastors. To me, there's never been a time when this is any more obvious Anybody can be a pastor. And if you're up on the how-to, especially in a Baptist church, and by the way, y'all, I'm not talking trash about Baptists. I am one. I've been one for 40 years. I won't make to be one. Ain't nobody put me in a full Nelson to get me to be one. I choose to be a Baptist because we're known as those who have the freedom to believe the Word of God and to preach it whether anybody likes it or not. Amen. That's why I'm a Baptist. Now, having said that, anybody can be a pastor. Today, in church circles, we hire pastors. They send a resume. They're called up for an interview. They're offered a package. If you don't like them, you fire them. None of the above do you find in the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. Only Lee knew that. It's in the book of Old Nehemiah. Yo, oh, we do it just like you go down to IBM and get a job. You say, well, is anything wrong with it? Well, yeah, God's not behind it. I still believe, and you still believe, even though you don't want to amen me because you're afraid it'll make me preach longer, God can still do now what He used to do. He really can. And when somebody needs a pastor, God can send one, whether He has a resume or can even write His name. Some of y'all are like, well, I ain't so sure about that. Y'all get the main thing as the main thing in your brain up there. It's God's will that we're after, not man's. Amen. Okay, well, that's 
At least to start. <laughs> Anybody can preach. Lost people can administrate. Secular people can supervise. <laughs> But to be a God-called pastor, a God-called shepherd, there's at least three things that he must be. One, he's got to be a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. Which means, number two, he's got to be a student of the Word of God. Which then also means, number three, he must be a doer of the Word, not just a preacher. Amen. And the reason I'm saying all this is because someone who's a disciple, a student, and a doer, the Word of God shows in their life. Doesn't matter whether they're in the pulpit or in the pew. And the more you consider the conversation of this man, the more you spectate on his lifestyle, the more of the Word of God you're going to see. Just to remember, a reminder, y'all, the Bible, which is the Word of God, it's our rule. It's our guideline. It's our gauge. It's our scale. Yeah. It's our benchmark. It's our yardstick. And it's our standard. It never changes. Yeah. It never fades. It never bends. It never twists. It never shrinks. It never grows. That's yeah. why the Bible says, Psalm 119.89, Thy word, O God, is forever settled in heaven. Yeah. Your forever is a long time. Amen? Amen. Psalm 119.1, 52. It's founded forever in heaven. And thirdly, 119, 160, it's true from the beginning and will endure forever. So why do you folks get so wound up about the Word of God? For all of those above reasons. It's the only thing we can count on. Amen? Amen. Period. I love the Word of God. I love studying that thing. Yeah. Now I can find my place on my notes. It's hard, it seems, for human beings to grasp. God never changes. Yeah, right. And I got to thinking about that, this thing. And you know what? And this may not be deep to some of you deep folks out there. He don't ever change because he's right. That's right. Now that blessed my heart. I have to change on occasion because I ain't right. Or because she says I ain't right. Anybody? Amen. I'm not right. Y'all, a good night. Everything I find in the Bible, is, it's all pointing to me, and I'm wrong, and I've got to get right, and I've got to have God make me right. But God's not that way, y'all. And His eternal rightness is manifested in His Word. Now today, our world is what I think would be safe to call trendy. Trendy. Everybody know about trends? Don't you love trends? I, I remember making a statement one time, and an old boy looked at me like, Man, what ails you? I like blue jean britches. All right? I got pictures, or my mama had pictures of me in blue jean britches. Now, they were wider than they were tall, but they were still blue jean. I liked them then. When I was in high school, I liked them. I still like them, y'all. I'm fixing to go to the rest hub. <laughs> and shirts with button-down collars. Every once in a while, she gets wild and crazy and decides to buy me some clothes. Waste of funds. I like button-down collars. I don't think I had them when I was a baby. I don't think they had buttons way back then. <laughs> but from the time I started dressing myself, I can remember button-down collars and blue jeans. Now, on occasion, when you have to go like formal, khaki pants. Amen. <laughs> I liked them then. I like it now. And what well, ain't style? Who is style? And what's he got to say about what I like? I don't understand how you can like one thing, but everybody says you've got to do something different. I don't, this trend thing is just beyond me. It's, it must be up here, and I'm down here, but the world is trendy. And in order to be fashionable, you've got to follow the trend. And the reason we want to be fashionable is so that we'll be acceptable. And the reason we want to be acceptable is that's how we can be politically correct. So in other words, you've got to do like every other domino in the box in order for folks to look at you and think, oh my, you remind me of every other domino in the box. So me and you can be buddies. Amen. Well, how about if you don't want to be a domino in the box? <laughs> if 
if you want to be different, man. Some of y'all are thinking, I'd be afraid to be different. Ain't nothing to be afraid of. I've tried and tested it. She married me, so. Anyway. Y'all, the Bible says 13.8. In fact, we just read it a minute ago. Jesus, this is neat. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's past, present, and future. Amen. The same. Right. For us, for me, I was, I am, I will be. For a while. For Jesus, I am, I am, I am. Amen. Now, I don't know how that works. He told him in John chapter 8, 58. Yeah, man, you're just a little whippersnapper. You're wrong on most points. He told them, listen, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Now that sounds like something Miss Dorothy would put a big red mark around as a school teacher. You're getting your tenses mixed up. No, I, I am mixed up, but Jesus said, I am. 314, Amen. book of Exodus. What am I going to tell him, God? Who is it that's sending me to Pharaoh? He said, just tell him, I am sent you. I am that I am. It's beyond my grasp. This part I can understand, though. I was, I am, I will be, maybe for a short time. None of that applies to him. Amen. Simply, I am, I am, I am. If you're a country, if you go like this, I is, I is, and I is. <laughs> I don't know how it works, y'all, but it speaks to the fact that he don't ever change. That's right, amen. Now, this is what sets the context for the next characteristic of serving God acceptably. Number five, establish your heart. Establish your heart. Any doctrine, verse 9, we just read it. Any doctrine that you come across that is diverse or strange will cause you to be carried about from that thing that never Changes. Amen. See, make sure you get the bridge built from the book to God. It's God's Word. <coughs> it's not man's rendition of God's Word, right. or that wouldn't work. We believe it's God's Word, and since He never changes, it never changes. Amen. People say, well, I ain't so sure I like that. Well, make your mind up. You'll, you'll see it better if you will. Carried about, verse 9. Carried about. Uh, an expression, a phrase in English from one uh, Greek word. Uh, again, a definition. Please indulge me, if you will. Peripharo. Peripharo. I'm sure I don't pronounce it correctly. Compound word. Peri. It's where we get our word. And this is, a, this is good. Perimeter. Perimeter. P-E-R-I. Comes right from the Greek. And perimeter, that's the outside. That's all around something. Then the other part of this compound word is pharaoh. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right, but it means to carry. So the picture painted by this word that God the Spirit chose was anything that's diverse from the Word of God, anything that's strange to the Word of God, will cause you to be carried all around everywhere except where you need to be on the Word of God. Amen. Anybody ever been there? You ever come up with some wild idea? An old boy called me one day and said, you know, I think I got something figured out. I think John the Apostle is still alive. <laughs> Easy, Carol. <laughs> you think what? John the Apostle is still alive. <laughs> like the old boy that started wrinkling up the potato chip wrap. You know. <laughs> You're breaking up. You're breaking up. <laughs> Click. I don't even want to talk to somebody like that. Well, according to the text, what is it that can carry you all around? Now remember, the one we're following never changes. All right? He ain't going nowhere. What is it that's going to make me go somewhere that he's not? Any doctrine, any teaching that is diverse or strange. Notice how it's worded there. If it's diverse, it's the word diverse means literally to vary. Something that varies from the plain Bible. The word uh, strange literally means foreign. Something that's foreign to the plain Bible. In other words, if we want to serve God acceptably, our hearts are going to have to be established 
and we're going to have to stay away from diverse things Amen. and strange things. Now, we've got a mindset in the world today to take anything that comes down the pike. Do you do that at the food bar at the steakhouse? No. If you do, you're a better man than me. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like the idea of knowing what I'm fixing to eat. Amen. Stuart, I know, me and you can appreciate this thing together. We got this cat. He'll eat most things he's been fed. I told him last night, if you'll eat anything that smells like that can I just opened up, you can eat anything. No, <laughs> but he does stick his nose up once in a while. Oh boy, at the uh, fellowship hall there one day, having a some Baptist fellowship. You know, that's where you eat. Amen. That's probably why I'm Baptist. <laughs> he went over there to the dessert table. You heard me say this before, but he picked up one of the desserts and looked at it and then put it back on the table. Stood there for a minute, looked at it again, picked it up again, laid it back down. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not making this up. Picked it up the third time and sniffed it. <laughs> put it back down, walked away, came back the fourth time. <laughs> and just turned and walked away, never eat no more that night. I thought, listen, I can commiserate. I don't want just anything coming down the pike. That's right. Now, you, I'll probably get in trouble here, but I'm kind of partial to the way my wife cooks. You're saying, that's obvious. <laughs> and so I'm suspect. I looked at, we were at the food bar there yesterday, going to get some uh, spiritual nutrition. And what the world, oh, I know what it was. I tried a piece of that uh, uh, fried fish. Now, I'm not really into fish. Y'all know that. filet o fish That's seafood for me. You know, <laughs> at McDonald's. But I, they got this one over there that just tastes like fried crust. <laughs> and I've been, yesterday it tasted like fish. I don't like the way fish taste. So <laughs> what in the world are you doing living here? I ain't got a clue. But anyway. <laughs> And I think, this is so perfect, y'all. This idea of in the church just buying anything that comes along, eating anything anybody serves you. Right. Gosh, no, y'all. Let me get another uh, definition here. Established. Uh, established with grace. If we're going to serve Him acceptably, we've got to have our heart established with grace. The word established means stabilized. Uh, made stable. Or in other words, no longer shifting, uh, or tilting, uh, or leaning, uh, or moving. You ever noticed on a piece of large equipment, they'll have outriggers. Uh, you know, a big platform, uh, this uh, thing we used to have that I worked on once in a while called a Go Devil. Probably shouldn't even mention the name, but it's like a portable crane is what it amounted to. It would lift all grades of weight. But it had outriggers. Some of these big machines that lift weight and crane off apparatus. They'll have outriggers. That thing to take the weight from the platform and trans uh, transfer it down to the ground. Uh, these fishing trawlers that we have around here are equipped with the same thing. Stabilizers, these uh, sheets of metal that go down in just under the surface of the water. And it helps to stabilize it. They're also known as outriggers. That's what our heart needs, is to be stabilized. Amen. Uh, as if we have spiritual outriggers going on so that the leaning and the tilting and the moving cuts down. I was on a ladder this week. Who here loves ladders? Aren't they a blessing? I don't mind the ladder, y'all. I always have to get the orange ones. Any of y'all that know ladders know what I'm talking about. He's crying right, right now. That's for fat guys. Ladders are color-coded. You didn't know that. Green ones for you little skinny rats. Blue ones for those y'all can't make your mind up. Them orange ones is for fat folks. Weighted at, uh, rated at 300 pounds. Every ladder I own is orange. Amen? You say, why would you do that? Because I don't want to walk up that thing and do shake, rattle, and roll. <laughs> I get it up on the deck. I drive nails down on either side of it so it won't slide one way or the other. I tie a rope around the top rung so it don't run out and leave me. <laughs> this business about physically, you know, cutting down on the movement, I can
can appreciate that, but something far more important than that, y'all, is my spiritual heart being made stable so that it's not rocking and rolling as I'm trying to live for God day in and day out. Amen. How many of us here know that can happen? you got an enemy that don't want you to make it. That's right. You've got an enemy that don't want you to believe today what you believed yesterday. Amen. You've got an enemy that don't want you to do anything for God whatsoever. And if all he can do is just make you miserable and question and fearful, he's got what he's That's after. Right. Amen. We need stable hearts. We need hearts without rigors on them, if you will. Establish, stabilize. Well, how is this spiritual heart established? Again, from the text, with grace. Grace. And I mention that again because Second Timothy, excuse me, Titus 2, 11 and 12. It's that predisposition of God to offer salvation to all folks, teaches us how to deny ungodliness, teaching us how to live soberly and righteously while we wait. That's the grace of God, and that's the thing that can stabilate us. And the Bible is the embodiment, if you will, of the grace of God. Yeah. It's how we learn His ways, and it's how we're taught to do right things. Amen. And if we're going to have established hearts, we must stay away from anything that's diverse and strange. That's right. Reckon what we could be talking about here. There were strange, diverse doctrines in the church even during the apostles' days. Mm. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 through 3, if you know the passage, this will be a blessing to you. It uh, addressed a certain attitude that I wish had died in that century, but it hasn't. It's that pick and choose theology attitude. It's that uh, uh, pick and choose, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, denomination attitude. Uh, it's that pick and choose your favorite preacher attitude. No, let me tell you, look, 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 listen. If it's real doctrine, if it's a real church, if that guy is a real God called man, they're all saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. They really are. You say, well, no, but I don't, they're not agreeing here with something ain't right there. Yeah. Y'all they have one Bible. 1189 uh, chapters. Every Bible, is, there are some now that vary. <laughs> Picked up one one day. What's the name of that? The New World Translation? Y'all don't want to make nobody mad, but if your Bible says the New World Translation, then it's the wrong Bible. Okay? Just take my word for it. And if between the Old Testament and the New Testament there's 16 extra books, it's the wrong Bible. Take my word for it. Because God never changes. He don't shrink. He don't grow. Amen. And so His Word's not going to. Those folks in the town of Corinth there had the, well, I, I prefer Paul more than I do Peter. Well, I like Apollos. Well, I'm better than all the other because I like Jesus better than all three of them. They all got rebuked. Hey, we're gods. We're to like God's thing, God's way, God's church, God's people. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15 addressed the idea. Now, don't you know this was a blessing to Paul? There's no resurrection. My first response would be, well, why bother? Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> we ain't going to rise again. Why bother? My wife said, you know, like when I talk about politicians. All right, I'm not talking about them. I'm going to talk at them. How about that? <laughs> if there weren't a resurrection, I'd be a politician. <laughs> hey, I can make a big salary for the rest of my life. I ain't got to buy no Obamacare. And I do what I blew the world, please, and won't ever get arrested. <laughs> well, you don't agree with that? <laughs> well, you run for politics. We'll see who wins. How about that? <laughs> No resurrection. Give me a blooming break, y'all. But it was in the church then. Paul said, man, what ails you? If there be no resurrection, you're still in your sins. And if you're still in your sins, you're going to die lost. And if you're going to die lost, guess what? You ain't going to have it. No resurrection. How about Galatians chapter 1 through 5? Uh, a little variance there, but if you know the book. Address the idea, well, yeah, you can be saved and follow this Jesus character, but you're going to have to be circumcised too. Paul said if you'd be circumcised, 
Christ died in vain. Yes. Strange, <laughs> diverse, foreign from the plain word of God, Colossians. Uh, address the idea of being preoccupied with angels. Now they're real. Thank God for our uh, children's sermon this morning. God said it so. How many times down through, even just my lifetime, some joker did a wild bit on angels, angels, and that's all they talk about. Y'all, it's, it's varying from the plain Bible. And that's the thing that will make you go around, go all the way around everything except where you're supposed to be. Second Thessalonians address the idea. In fact, check it out yourself, verse 2 and 3. There were people saying, hey, the day of the Lord's right here and now. It's fixing to happen. I'm going to go out in the backyard and have rapture practice right now. <laughs> and Paul said, look, don't you remember what I told you when I was here last time? Paul went on to say, there are several things that's got to happen before that day. Right. In other words, hey, get back in the Bible and be a student again. Amen. 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 <laughs> Greg can relate to this. Uh, he went to, in fact, he graduated from Southeastern. I took a class over there. Amen. <laughs> First day of orientation, the guy got up, and I thought to myself, you try to tell all the rest of us we need to be politically correct and sensitive to everybody's feelings because you don't ever want to you know, make anybody mad in the church view, right amen? He stood up and said, listen, you're here to learn, not teach. He's talking to preachers. Wow. Oh, yeah, wow. Well, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the preachers think, man, I have arrived. Give me own, my own edited Bible, the King John Version. <laughs> and whoa, Hoss, you're here to learn from those that know, not teach. In other words, zip it, clip it, nip it. What? Yeah. <laughs> Good gracious sakes. Paul said, do you remember what I told you? Book of James, this rung a lot of bells, addressed the fact that there were those who thought that I could have faith and no works and go to heaven. How about that? But of course the point being here that's being made is stay in the Bible. Amen. Stay in the Bible. Amen. Anything, anyone, any idea it's not in the Bible, get rid of it. Amen. Plain and simple. I don't think there's as much of this that goes on now. That I, I, it may not be right now. But the TV guys, I know I talk trash about TV preachers. And some of the times I'm poking fun. Like the guy with the blue hair. Looked on there one day, this has been years ago, he looked like a lion. <laughs> but, well, one of David's mighty men killed a lion-like man. Maybe that'll work. The old TV used to have some really strange things on it. But the one I like, and I'm thinking about trying, I'll get the front row's permission over here. They got this great big stage football field along. They got all kinds of couches and recliners. It's all Queen Anne. You know. All grades of people. I don't know who the people are, but they're like in groups and categories. And while Catfish is preaching, one group will stand up and they'll cheer for a few minutes. Got another group over here singing. And every once in a while they all get up and start waving their hankies in the air. This is all going on behind me. I'm thinking, if I had that, I'd be like a quarterback who his lineman just wiped out nine out of those 11 defenders. The other two's done headed for the shower room, and I'm going to just run down. The, in fact, I'll probably run the length of the field four times before I step over to goal. I'm thinking about trying that. Anybody think it would be a good idea? <laughs> I'd probably preach for like two or three days at a time. Somebody cheering me on. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I know you're glad. <laughs> Y'all, <laughs> don't ever jump on no bandwagon. Don't ever follow a trend. Don't ever leave the straight and narrow for anything that's wide and winding. May not be as much of it on TV. I don't know. Don't spend my time that way. But y'all, Straight and narrow 
is still that. Amen. Learn your Bible, stay in the Bible. In fact, Acts 17, 21, Paul was in a place called Mars Hill. You recall the area of it. He went there to talk to some folks. Verse 21, Acts 17, told us of a group of folks, 60 AD, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. That's what flipped their switch. What made them want to go listen to Paul was they heard something they had never heard of before. Resurrection of the dead. They referred to him as a babbler. Let's go hear what this babbler has to say. Y'all, don't you wish that had died in 60 AD? We got folk today who will not get excited unless some strange new thing is brought up in the church. Well, we're going to have a conference on prophecy. Well, your prophecy is obviously a good thing. It comes from the Word of God. And they'll show up 15 nights in a row. But to come to church 52 weeks out of the year, three times a week, oh, I ain't got time. Do you see the leaning of that? Yeah. Y'all, what we're after is to learn the whole counsel of God. Amen. And it's as we learn this thing that our heart gets those outriggers put down so that this week, when that pretty little thing walks by men, that you know you ain't got no business tantalizing your poor old brain with, you'll have a power that you did not before have. I am not going to do that. Bingo! Nice weather we're having. And when you ladies are confronted, maybe with that new style, that new trend, and, uh -huh, I'm going to follow that thing if it kills him and his credit cards. <laughs> You'll have that power to say, uh, no, nope, ain't going there. Don't need that. I've got a God who will supply my every need. Bingo! There it is. Now, those are foolish examples, but the truth of the matter is, you'll be able to stand there, and when the dust settles, you'll still be standing there for Christ. Amen. You won't have anything to repent of, anything to be sorry for when you come into church next Sunday morning. You'll be ready to give God some thanks because He's helped you this week. Amen. And I'm glad I'm not religious. That stuff would get real old to me real quick. A uh, religious church smells like mothballs. Oh, amen. All the folk that work there look like the cats at the funeral home. Present company exclude. <laughs> uh uh. No, sir, buddy. Jesus is real. Uh, I've met him. The old boy said, I know he's real. I just talked to him this morning. <laughs> I love it. And he'll be with you. And he'll help you, and he'll stabilize you if you are willing to stay away from the the, uh, the foreign, uh, the various, varied, if you're willing to stay away from the strange. Hey. <coughs> Would you be willing to do it? I think the strangest thing I've ever heard, what's the other word there? Diverse, strange, not, it's the most diverse thing I've ever heard. Is that I can make it to heaven without Jesus. Where'd you come up with that? Have born and died with this thing being read over them? It's still here and they're not. Yeah. You know how many godly ancestors you've probably had that's prayed for you? A little boy on the radio I heard one time said, uh, what was it, three generations back he had a granddaddy, a godly man, who prayed for five generations of his offspring. And all five of those generations of serving God today and praying. Oh, it's real. Why would anybody think that a book that is so old, so true, and tried and tested by so many people, why would you think that you could make it without the one that it talks about? Amen. And I encourage you this morning to listen to what the Word of God says. Not me. Don't worry. He doesn't <coughs> like me. But he does want to make you a believer. And then a disciple. And that's what the Bible calls a saint. Somebody that belongs to God. Now, you can't have me no more. I belong to God. I'm set apart for Him. Pray. I'm asking you to join me and pray with me.
And we're going to ask God just to do in these last few moments what only He can do. And let's persuade our hearts. Father, in the name of Jesus, how we need you. How we need you. God, I remember hearing Billy Graham make the statement, or at least express the statement. The most important part of any gospel service is the invitation time. Because that's where the proverbial rubber hits the road. That's where the proverbial foot comes down off the ladder and stands on the ground. That's when the decision has to be made. God, there may be someone here this morning who's not walking with you. They'll never know peace. They'll never know safety. And there certainly can't be any hope for the future. So we're praying, Father, that you'll convince, you'll persuade. That you'll make that one see. <coughs> give him, give her the strength of heart to respond to you today ask you to come in, ask you to forgive, ask you to take him back, if that's the case. Lord, we're asking for a supernatural work here. Just look to you for it, not to me, not to anybody else. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. While we continue in prayer, our group's fixing to sing one of the old